good morning everyone am i audible yes sir you are and good morning to everyone present my my name is arnav anuj kasar and i am the second session chair uh, other than dr pankaj kumar who is a assistant professor at nit nagaland and what uh, we have at our hand today is the session 3 uh, of the first day in the first half so in this session we have around eight papers listed uh, for presentations and we have a very wide area of uh, research uh, in different domains to be covered during our session so i welcome to uh, i welcome all of the uh, 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 authors and speakers present here and we would start the sessions in after a brief introduction by dr pankaj okay probably dr pankaj is struggling with a, a poor internet or something or the other uh, but uh, to uh, start or kick start our sessions i would first like to say that we have in all uh, in this session we have eight papers which we will be discussing uh, and out of these eight the four of the authors are present here and they will be presenting their work the let me list out the titles of the presentations that we have today the first uh, of the entries that we have got is uh, a review on non destructive techniques for corrosion monitoring in reinforced concrete structures Uh, the article has been written by Ms. Ashwarya Thakur along with Dr. Sorab, uh, and Ms. Ashwarya Thakur is the presenting author. The second paper is addition of seashell waste to silty sand subgrade for economical design of flexible pavement, and we have four authors for this paper, and the presenting author is Mrs. S. Muthu uh, S. Muthu Lakshmi. Uh, the third paper is bending deflection and natural frequencies of micro slash nano beams using a third order single variable non local beam theory and this paper is also written by four authors and among them dr rajesh shetty is going to present the work the fourth entry that we have that will be seen today is uh, on the is on the topic of analysis of soft story building with different type of steel bracings using uh, sorry under seismic loads and this work has been conducted by mrs akila lal and dr mani ramana and, and mrs akila lal will be presenting the work the coastal slope failure analysis a case study on baga hill goa is con has been conducted by kohima desai and dr sumitra kandotkar and ms kohima desai is going to present the work sixth entry is application of direct displacement based design method on mid rise open ground story rc frame buildings mr anurag sharma dr rk tripathi and dr govardhan bhat has written the paper and mr anurag sharma is here with us to present the paper Seventh entry is 
on the design and construction of rainwater harvesting system, an innovative approach or a new approach. And Dr. Rajesh Kumar Pandey is going to present the paper. He has two other co-authors with him. The last entry is on the behavior of aerated alkali activated composite wall panels. And this paper has been written by Dr. S. Geeta uh, and Dr. M. Selva Kumar and Mrs. S. Mutulakshmi. And Dr. Geeta is going to present this work. So I welcome all of you once again in the session. And uh, with this, I would like to pass on the baton to the first speaker. And I would recommend Mr. Anurag Sharma to present his work in the first slot because that is the work that i would first like to hear and it would be a good initiation i feel to the session so mr anurag sharma please uh, present your work i am very uh, interested in listening to you uh, also there are some i'm sorry there are certain instructions which are shared with you on the screen as you can see as of now uh, we have a cash prize of rupees 5000 and a best paper certificate which are to be awarded to three three uh, participants or three three works research works that are there in among the 98 publications that we have received the Allotted time for the presentation. This is one of the most important points that we should all keep in mind that uh, the allotted time for the presentation is 10 minutes. And among this, uh, and apart from this, five minutes over and above have been kept for question and answers from the various participants or from the session chair. So I'll sound a buzzer at around eight minutes so that the uh, authors are or the presenters are aware that only two minutes are left and that is almost all i have to say before we start listening to sir on action much sir please continue uh, good morning sir so is my voice audible yes it is it is you can uh, share your screen as well yes sir just a moment Sir, is my PPT visible, sir? Yes, it is, sir. It is. It is. Yes. Please. It uh, is visible. Sir, can I start? Yes. Please. Good morning, everyone. I am Anuraj Sharma from NIT Raipur, and I am going to present my topic: application of direct displacement baseline method on mid-rise open ground story RC frame building. We'll start with introduction, then we'll go to objectives, modeling, results, and discussion. Then finally, we'll conclude with conclusion. As we all know that the contemporary design practices of structures considers force-based design method for the designing of structures. Most of the current national codes, such as standard number 2800 of Iran, Turkish Hizmi Code 2007 of Turkey, and our own IS 8093 follows force-based force design method. In force-based design method, buildings are primarily designed for elastic responses of for forces under design basic earthquake as given in the national codes. But what we have found from the previous literatures that even though this FBD method is conceptual for the elastic behavior, but under severe earthquake, it fails to distribute forces and load across the building in post elastic conditions, due to which it may result in the considerable damage of members. Therefore, in recent years, the current design philosophies are moving towards more performance-based approaches than the force-based approaches. That's why we are going for the performance-based design. So first of all, we should know what is performance-based design. So PPD is nothing but a design philosophy in which the design criteria are expressed in terms in achieving the state level performance objectives for the seismic hazard. Generally in PPD, performance level are described for the design and drifts so, so that a relationship can be formed between the damage level to the performance level. 
which gave a new idea called as displacement based design where the basic assumption is that strength is less important than displacement also the direct displacement based design is an offset which whose main focus is to find the required strength at the designated plastic hinges in order to achieve the target design which we have de designed which we have defined either in terms of displacement or drift so as my studies also studies about the open ground story so as you all know that the most common form of vertically irregular rc frame building is open ground story where the irregularity lies at the bottom story which means that the buildings which are constructed without masonry infills in the ground story can be called as open ground story buildings these are generally used for the parking spaces mainly for the urban areas but what we have seen from the last studies or the previous studies that even though the ogs are in huge demand the several ogs building collapsed in earthquakes and the failure is generally attributed to the sudden reduction of stiffness in the ground story as compared to the upper infill stories what our indian court says that if story can be considered as soft if the lateral stiffness is less than 70% of that in the story above or than the 80% of the lateral stiffness of the three stories if you look at the above figure this is how a typical open ground story buildings are constructed in india whereas the bottom story represents the failure of open ground story buildings which is occurred during the bhuj earthquake in 2001 so as we all know that in india most of the buildings are still designed using force based design method that's why in this paper we are going to propose the applicability of ddbd method on reinforced concrete buildings which are situated in indian seismic regions for that to have a better comparisons we have taken three different frames called as bare frame as we know it has no masonry infills in the any story full infill frame which are having masonry infills in all the stories and the open ground story frames having masonry in all the stories except the ground story for that we have performed non linear time history analysis to investigate its seismic behavior also the influence of ddbd approach of rc frames were investigated with the help of bayes shear time period inter story drift ratios and fragility curves in this slide we'll discuss about the description and design of rc frame buildings if you look we have taken three different plans bare frame full infill frames and open ground story frames which is having the same plan area of 12 meter into 12 meter having three bays in x direction three bays in y y direction with the length of 4 meter each <clears throat> in this slide we'll also discuss about the <clears throat> beams and column details the beams have been chosen same for the all the three plans whereas the column has been obtained from the ddbd approach for the simplicity purpose we have kept the column and beam sizes same throughout the height of the building also we have as i told we have done the non linear time history analysis with the help of 10 different ground motions for that sap 2000 software has been used for performing non linear dynamic analysis in order to use this ground motions we have made this ground motions compatible with the site locations of zone 5 medium soil conditions of the indian region as per our code with the help of seismomatch software moving on to the results and discussion part the first two parameters we have chosen as base shear and time history so from the figures it can be observed that the for the bare frame as compared to bare frame both fully infilled and ogs exhibits higher base shear value of 53 to 50 to 51% obviously due to the presence of masonry infills which results in high stiffness of the frames now due to the results of high stiffness of the frames bare frame is having the highest time period which is about 42 to 66% higher than open ground story and fully infill frame whereas due to the presence of infills in the ground story fully infill frame have the lowest time period which is around 46% lower than the ogs frame moving on to our next parameter which is inter story drift ratio as we know most of the previous researchers have used this as the indicator of damage if you look at the first one it's discussed about the bare frame where the maximum drift can be found for the chamoli yoshi mud of 1.32 percentage whereas for the fully infilled the maximum can be found for the chamoli uki mud whereas for open ground story the maximum has been found in the ground story for the chamoli yoshi mud if you look the major thing to be noticed here is that for all the plans what we have taken for all the frames the target drift of 2% has been well satisfied by the ddbd method moving on to the next parameter which is fragility curves so first of all what is fragility curves so fragility curves can be defined as the statistical measure when it shows the probability of accidents poe of a selected engine demand parameter for a selected damage level of a specified ground motion intensity measure 
for our study, we have used ISDR as the EDP and the PJ as the intensity measure. From the figures, what we observed that the minimum variability in the curves is for the slight damage, whereas for the maximum can be observed for the collapse damage. And moderate and extensive has been lies between somewhere between slight and collapse damage for all the three frames. Also in the study, we have compared the POE for the particular damage state. From the figures, what we have observed that for all the damage states, POE of bare frames is lower than the OGS and FF frames. Also, the POE of OGS building is high even at the lower PG for all damage except the collapse damage. Which means that due to the presence of infill frames in the fully infilled, it is less vulnerable than the open ground story frames. So from overall, what we have concluded that in the OGS building, the absence of, the absence of infill walls in the bottom stories make it most vulnerable under earthquake as compared to bare frame and fully infill frame. The variability of probability of accidents in slight damage is much lesser for, for all the different frame buildings. As we can see, there is a significant increase in the variability with the increase in damage state. So the main important thing what we have got that based on the time history results, we can conclude that the DDBD approach is highly significant in designing all the three types of mid-rise RC frames, which are situated in high seismic zones of Indian region. To overall summit, we can say that this study will motivate and encourage the practicing structural design engineers to go for DDBD method over the FBD method for designing seismic resistant buildings, especially for the Indian conditions. Thank you all. Yes, sir. Oh, that was very quick. Thank you. Thank you for uh, yes, sir. I for the time limit. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, so I invite anybody who has some questions to Anurag, sir, please ask. You can unmute yourself and ask your questions. There is no issues there. I think, uh, and also there is no question from audience side. So Anurag, I have a very basic question. Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Pankaj Kumar. Yes, sir. So as you said, if instead of open ground floor, if we provide infill walls, in that case, the structure is less vulnerable, right? Yes, sir. in most of the cases, yes, sir. Uh, but is it a practical solution? Sir, it is not a practical solution. The Actually, the practical solution will be since the open, open ground story is in high demand and it is a bit vulnerable, so we can go for the retrofitting of it. Or, but uh, but uh, as in our studies, we have gone for the DDBD method. So here we have used the DDBD method according to Prisley, what they have given in their book in two, uh, with, they have written in 2007, Prisley and their co-authors, Ko uh, Kowalski and Kalvi. So they have given mainly about the RC frame buildings. Actually, in my PhD, I am working on this only, that I am tr trying to generate a new displacement profile for the direct displacement based design for the open ground story building. So this is just a part of my PhD, uh, which I presented, sir. Where? So what we are trying to recommend here, there are two important things that you discussed in your presentation. First yes. is the development of DDBD, where you uh, do you also support the belief that strength is less important than displacement? I don't think displacement is the correct word. I re recommend you to consider the word deformability in that place. Yes. But again, uh, is strength uh, better? Is strength not as important as deformability for a structure? It, sir, there was a slide in your presentation. Yes, sir, said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So actually, strength is also that much important. Actually, both has uh, both FBD and DDBD differs in that only. So uh, as per this, this is actually a new method coming up where uh, still the research is going on. So we are trying to have a balance between the strength and displacement so that it we can uh, make a very good seismic resistant buildings overall. Case. 
so what range of deformability do you suggest is is good enough for a structure to be called a safe structure so so considering range... all the serviceability conditions what limit of deformability do you recommend for any structure actually sir we have like taken the, yes, the indian standard as of now suggests that the deformability uh, that should be ensured in case of a special moment resisting frame building should be of the order of around 4% yes sir yes so what do That's you good. suggest is it a less uh, do you suggest a lesser number or a higher number of deformability actually sir we have gone with the fema 356 where we have where there are three different uh, uh, levels are there immediate occupancy io level life safety level and collapse prevention level so in this we have gone for the life safety level as per the fema 356 with the recommendation with the targeting drift of 2% so if we go okay. with the global drift level uh, okay. that can be more applicable than the our indian code uh, what they suggest so you are suggesting a lesser deformability uh, value for a uh, structure even though you are advocating higher deformability in your structures so there is a confusion that i sense please please clear it out for yourself i i feel that uh, fema even fema 356 and yes, 360 as well recommends three, uh, in in fact the in our standards we have only omrf and smrf yes sir yes they have one more category called imrf intermediate moment resisting frames yes which has a deformability limit of 2% while in special moment resisting frames in case of fema as well the yes, deformability sir. limit that they suggest is 4% only so what yes, we have done is we have just uh, i don't know whether because of the limitations that we have uh, based on our conditions we have just ignored the second or the intermediate level yes sir yes we sir. have only two types of frames where uh, r value changes from 3 to 5 yes in sir. case of uh, so the response reduction is done on the basis of how much deformability you want from your structure no so uh, that IS 1893 में जो R आता है ना response yes, reduction yes. factor हाँ सर that हाँ, is based primarily on how much deformability do you sure. want yes, so sir. you can have a better or larger value of R if you want larger deformability but is it recommended do you recommend it that is the question that you should think about anyways thank you very much if anybody else has any question to ask of Mr Anurag please go ahead Okay thank you Mr Anurag for our Yes sir thank you so much sir uh, Can I stop sir? presenting sir Sure 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 thing sir Thank you, you thank can. you so much sir thank you sir So let me call upon the next speaker uh, I would invite Mrs S Muthu Lakshmi if she is present in the presentation to uh, present her yes, work Yes sir Yes sir Ma'am, just a moment please please go ahead yeah. is the screen visible sir not yet ma'am it is now okay sir please start ma'am please yeah just a moment sir Sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Please make it full screen, yeah. if possible. Yeah, just just a moment. Now, is it uh, visible, sir? Full screen? No, ma'am. The window you have shared is of PPT. Please share another window of the full screen presentation. When you will click on oh, the actually, present uh, button. Yeah, yeah. I, I have clicked. It's uh, full screen on my screen, but uh, is it visible over there? Uh, 
no it is not you should uh, you should press the uh, you should go back to google meet by pressing alt tab you should press alt and tab together you will come to google meet and present the full screen version Now is it visible, sir? Full screen? No, ma'am. Actually, uh, here there is some net network issues, sir, because uh, uh, heavy rains no in Chennai you and can, it's uh, flooded. So, no, uh, shall no, I shall proceed with this slide? Uh, yes, please, please, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. Are the slides changing, sir? Just a moment. Are the slides changing, sir? Yes, ma'am, they are. They are. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I just press it this way, sir. Okay. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Myself, Vesmuthu Lakshmi, Assistant Professor, Senior Grade from Department of Civil Engineering, Raja Lakshmi Engineering College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. Uh, my topic is related to addition of seashell waste to silty and subgrade economical design of flexible pavement. Is the slide changing, sir? I think there's some issue. Not yet. It is taking some time. Probably the PPT is yeah. too heavy to load. I think it has changed. Yes, ma'am, it is. It has. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, as we all know, seashell waste is one of the major uh, waste that is generated from uh, fish farming industries, fish markets, hotel industry, which is generally dumped in open landfill areas and uh, in seashores, along the seashores, into the sea, ocean and all, which gives a very uh, unpleasant sight, uh, visually doesn't look good and also it gives very bad smell and all those things results in wastage of useful land area. So my topic is basically, can we use this seashell waste as the admixture with any locally available soil and can we improve strength so that uh, if the strength is improving, maybe we can reduce the thickness of the flexible pavement, which in turn will reduce the material costs involved and results in an economical flexible, uh, flexible pavement design. So the objective of this study is to determine what is the optimum content of crushed seashell waste that can be added to a locally available soil that is silty sand so that uh, maximum shear strength and severe strength are achieved. And what is the uh, amount of strength that is maximum strength UCC and severe strength is obtained and when compared with the virgin soil or the untreated soil and how much is the quantity of flexible uh, uh, thickness of flexible Payment. What is the percentage reduction in thickness of flex, uh, flexible pavement that can be achieved by adding this optimum quantity of uh, crushed seashell waste? I think. Uh, I think there's some issue with this. So the experimental work involved, uh, uh, we collected disturbed soil sample from Brahmatism area in Tiruvannamalai district of Tamil Nadu. And uh, basic index properties of soil was carried out, uh, like specific gravity of soil, wet seam analysis, Atterberg's limit, like liquid limit, plastic limit test, standard Proctor compaction test. And we uh, classified the soil based on Indian standard uh, classification system. 
the seashell waste was collected from kanchipuram district of tamil nadu and uh, the seashell waste was washed with, uh, cleaned with water to remove the salinity of uh, sea water then dried under sun and uh, i have used crush uh, crush seashell waste so i have crushed the seashells to the fine great size that is 4.75 mm to 75 micron before using them in the lab book So based on the standard product compaction test, uh, maximum dry density and optimum moisture content uh, values that was obtained from compaction test. Uh, soil specimen for UCC test and CDR test was prepared at 97% relative compaction and uh, crushed seashell was added in percentages of 10% to 40%, increasing at every 5%. And UCC test and soil CDR test were carried out on the untreated soil and on uh, the uh, silty sand soil having varying percentages of crushed seashell waste. These are the index properties of the soil uh, and based on the Atterberg's limit test, is liquid limit, plastic limit values, plasticity index values and wet sieve analysis, the soil was classified as silty sand. Sorry this to interrupt you, ma'am. These are the properties of uh, crushed seashell waste. Uh, please, specific gravity of uh, the crushed seashell waste found out to be 2.42. Uh, the shells were dried and then used. So moisture content was 0% and water absorption test, it gave 0%. Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, am I audible? Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but please switch off your camera yes, so sir. that we can hear your, your voice. Uh, audible, your voice is audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah. it is breaking, breaking. So, in that case. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Here, specific gravity was 2.42. Moisture content was dried and used in the lab work, so moisture content was 0%. Water absorption value was 0%. And the seashells were crushed to the particle size of 4.75 mm to 75 micron and then used in the lab test. And percentage of fines, that is, particles less than 75 micron, was found to be 0.8%. These are the uh, Stress strain curves, that is UCC test was conducted on soil with varying percentage of crust seashell waste. The uh, percentages added were 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40%. And these are the stress strain curves obtained from UCC test. Uh, these are the uh, um, unconfined compressive strength of the soil obtained with varying percentage of crust seashell waste. And it was found that maximum shear strength was obtained for soil with 35% crust seashell waste. And it was uh, the value obtained was 100.2 kilopascal. Uh, uh, the inference from this particular test was as the quantity of crushed seashell waste was increased in the soil, it was observed that uh, the soil failed at higher stress values but at lower strain which indicated a brittle failure as compared to that of ducti ductile failure observed in virgin soil or in the soil having lesser quantities of crushed seashell waste. So this uh, this may be due to the fact that the seashell waste interfered with the bonding between the soil grains and thus resulted in a brittle failure. Peak UCC strength, con unconfined compressive strength of 100.2 kilopascal was achieved for soil with 35% crushed seashell waste and the improvement in shear strength of 2.26 times that of controlled specimen was observed. So it was, uh, so we can say that ideal percentage to be added is 35% crushed seashell waste based on shear strength test. Then uh, CBR tests, so unsoaked CBR tests and soaked CBR tests were carried out. Uh, this is the uh, load penetration curve obtained in uh, unsoaked CBR test for soil with varying percentages of crushed seashell waste. Uh, based on the unsoaked CBR values, it was observed that maximum unsoaked CBR strength of 12.9% was achieved. Again, for soil with 35% as seashell waste. And uh, the flexible pavement uh, thickness was calculated to be 202.3 uh, mm as compared to that of 389.5 mm calculated for 
virgin soil. So uh, from the unsoaked CVR test, it was observed that as the quantity of crust seashell waste is increased, uh, the resistance of soil to the plunger penetration in CVR tests was had also increased. Maximum unsoaked CVR of 12.9% was obtained for soil with 35% crust seashell waste and the improvement of three times that of the controlled specimen or virgin soil was obtained. So this resulted in a very, uh, this, res this reduced the thickness of the flexible pavement uh, and the percentage reduction in flexible pavement of 48.1% was obtained, thus leading to an economical pavement construction. Similarly, soak CBR test was carried out. This is the load penetration curves obtained for different soil samples. And maximum soak CBR strength of 6.88% was achieved for soil with 35% crust seashell waste and uh, pavement thickness of 299 mm was calculated as compared to that of three, uh, 633 uh, mm uh, calculated for virgin soil. So maximum uh, soak CBR value of 6.88% was observed and it was found that uh, the increase in soak CBR strength of four times that of controlled specimen was observed as compared to that of unsoaked CBR uh, increase of three times that of the controlled specimen. So uh, the inf uh, we can conclude that uh, adding seashell waste to silty sand soil had a more positive effect on soak CBR strength as compared to that of unsoaked CBR strength. Thus indicating that uh, seashell waste reduced the effect of soaking on the strength of the soil. Uh, the thickness of the flexible pavement also reduced and percentage decrease was found to be 52.8%. Thus it resulted in a uh, economical flexible pavement. Uh, it, re it reduced the material costs that were involved in the construction of the flexible pavement. Thus leading to the conservation of construction materials like stones, gravel, soil, etc. used in the base course and sub-base course layers of the uh, flexible payment which are non-renewable natural resources so uh, ultimately it resulted in an economical as well as sustainable construction the conclusion is uh, the maximum and uh, shear strength of 100.2 kilopascal was achieved maximum unsoaked cbr strength of 12.9 percent and maximum soak cbr strength of 6.88 percent was achieved for Silty sand soil having 35% crust seashell waste. So the ideal percentage to be added is 35%. This also resulted in the reduction in the thickness of the flexible pavement, uh, thus resulting in an economical construction. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a yeah, lot thank for the wonderful you. presentation. The work that you have carried out carries a lot of potential and i hope we can someday see the use of seashells in construction of payments yeah, uh, yes. i would like to i would like to ask the audience to please ask any questions that they have this is the time for the question answer session Thank you, ma'am, for wonderful presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, two, three very basic questions. Yeah, yes, sir. As you, uh, reflecting your title that, as you said, it is economical flexible payment design. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so how you are considering economy in this particular presentation or in your research? So by adding uh, optimum quantity of crust seashell waste, that is 35%, the maximum CBR strength is obtained. Uh, when compared to that of the untreated soil so flexible payment design or the thickness of the flexible payment is based on the cbr method that is more the cbr value lesser will be the thickness of the flexible payment so the thickness is reducing so which in turns uh, will reduce the material costs that are involved in the construction of the payment thus it results in an economical design at one point uh, if as you said we are using uh, in your presentation use crust Seashell, right? Waste. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yes, uh, if we are crushing seashell, we we are getting almost same size. Uh, 
no sir uh, uh, no sir if it if we don't crush it is size is greater than 4.75 mm no uh, 10 mm no uh, it is okay right but if mm we are crushing sisel yeah if we are crushing in mm. that case we are getting almost same size after the crushing. uniformity of these yeah 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 it's in the, the range of yeah crushing. yeah it's in the range of 4.75 mm to 75 microns so in that case it means uh, it must be poorly graded if we are adding it at somewhere uh you mean to say the no but when you are yeah. mixing uh no i i didn't understand so what i uh so if you are adding crushed sisal yeah, yeah, in yeah. centisand in yeah. that case you are getting poor gradation instead of well gradation if i am not wrong mm. then how you are ensuring uniformity of size no sir the basically why i have added uh, seashell is the main component in seashells is calcium carbonate so over a period of time uh, i have done, i have not done the testing over a period of time but we can do uh, uh, like the further scope of work would be uh, continue the test and uh, do the testing after say 30 days 60 days 90 days where we can observe that there is a uh, increase in strength due to some uh, reactions occurring between the silica and alumina present in the soil with the calcium carbonate present in the Uh, seashells resulting in cementitious products like uh, calcium silicate hydrates and calcium alumina hydrates so many of the research papers they have added uh, seashell waste in powder form so i have crushed it and i have added in the soil range in in the range of 4.75 mm to 75 micron so i don't think uh... so in that case uh, if uh... no we we can... see a poorly graded or well graded for fine grained soil uh, for a, like a sand uh, like fine aggregates for sand only we uh, give the term as poorly graded or uh, well graded uh, sand but for silty uh, sand uh, it's a combination of silt is also present in sand it's a mixture of silt and sand that soil okay and at one point you said you are getting ucc as well as cbr value maximum at 35% 35% yeah right is there any specific region because uh, the, at 40% also you are yeah, getting yeah. lesser value yeah it's lesser as well value as and this, yeah yeah maybe 35% uh, the fa uh, the fact may be that uh, 35% is the quantity added when the reaction is fully taking place and it is forming those uh, uh uh cementitious products like if more is added there is no sufficient uh, silica and alumina present in soil for the reaction to take place and if less is added then i uh calcium carbonate is not sufficient for the reactions to take place so at 35% the quantity of silica alumina present in soil is sufficient for the reaction to complete with the uh calcium carbonate present in the uh, seashells uh, is there any counter study Uh, conducted by you to check uh, to verify this aspect or not uh, no i mean the further scope of work i'm planning to continue like this was done immediately we didn't cure the specimens and we didn't do the testing but in further scope of work i'm planning to do it like after 30 days 60 days uh, how is the strength going to improve is it going to improve more or is it going to decrease or is it going to remain at the same level okay thank you thank you sir okay ma'am thank you very much yeah thanks. thank you very much yeah. uh i would request professor shetty uh, rajesh shetty ji to please uh, present his work uh, yes sir okay uh, i will share my screen sure thing sir the title of the work carried out by dr shetty is bending deflection and natural frequencies of micro nano beams using a third order single variable non local beam theory so let us uh, uh, sir uh, are you able to see my screen yes sir we are okay uh, uh, good morning all uh, i am dr rajesh shetty uh, now i am going to present a paper entitled uh, bending deflections and natural frequencies of micro or nano beams using a single variable non local beam theory 
the co-authors of this paper are Mr. Deepak S. A., uh, Mr. Dushant Kumar J. L., and uh, Mr. Sudhir K. K. Okay. Uh, the objectives of this work uh, is to demonstrate the effectiveness of a single variable non-local beam theory uh, by carrying out bending and free vibration analysis of uh, micro and nano beams, uh, uh, beams of uh, rectangular cross section. So in this work, what we are going to discuss is we are going to discuss about a, sing a simple single variable non-local beam theory. Uh, this uh, theory has uh, uh, is this year is uh, similar to the Euler Bernoulli beam theory, and uh, uh, this uh, theory uses a, a single variable as the unknown function. And uh, th there are many equations which are uh, similar to as those of Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Uh, so, this is a simple theory. So, we will uh, do the analysis of bending and free vibration analysis of beams using this theory. Okay, uh, first we will uh, discuss uh, the main, the, what is the difference between local elasticity and non-local elasticity. Uh, here, okay, uh, the first uh, point that is classical continuum mechanics or this is classical classical elasticity. In case of class, classical elasticity, we have, we are familiar with the definition means like stress at a point is a function of strain at that point. But there is some difference in case of non-local elasticity. For example, uh, in this uh, paper, we have used the Iringian's theory of non-local elasticity. Okay, in this case of non-local elasticity, uh, the stress at a point is a function of strains at all points in the continuum. For example, here, if you refer to equation one, here we have the uh, stress tensor, and here we have the strain tensor, and we here we have the uh, the elastic modulus matrix. And uh, in the classical el elasticity or local elasticity, we have the, uh, the stress is equal to uh, constant into uh, strain. But in this case, we have this additional term. Okay, this is the part of the Iringian's non-local elasticity theory. So we will in the uh, upcoming equations, we will uh, see this additional term. When we write the, uh, the expression between the stress and the strain, we will have this additional term. Okay, here uh, the terms are defined, uh, sigma ij stress tensor and epsilon kl strain tensor and uh, this is the uh, elastic modulus tensor and this is the laplacian operator and uh, that is the laplacian operator we require when we have two dimension or three dimension analysis but in this case we have a one dimension analysis so we will have simple differentiation equation and here e naught and a uh, e naught is a constant appro appropriate to each material and a is an internal characteristics length that is length of uh, cc bond or carbon carbon bond Okay, in this case, uh, uh, what we are going to use, uh, we have a single variable theory and we will use the Iringian's non-local elasticity theory and uh, with the help of this, we will do the analysis of uh, uh, micro and non-local beams. Uh, okay, one more thing here, uh, the other theories uh, available in the literature, the important beam theory based on Iringian's non-local elasticity are, that is uh, non-local Euler Bernoulli beam theory, non-local Timoshan beam theory, non-local Brady beam theory means the classical uh, theories, uh, these classical theories are uh, um, modified by using the Iringian's non-local uh, theory. So therefore, uh, we use the, use the non-local theory. Okay. So this is the uh, research gap. Uh, so here we have the, uh, we uh, all studied about the elementary beam theory in our uh, mechanics of solids uh, subject. So we are familiar with the euler bernoulli beam theory or elementary beam theory. In case of Euler, uh, using the euler bernoulli beam theory, we can capture only the bending deformation. Means uh, we can't capture the shared uh, deformation in case of euler bernoulli beam theory. So uh, therefore, the uh, euler bernoulli beam theory can be used only for the case of slender beams. Next, we have the shear deformation beam theories. Uh, so these theories, shear deformation, shear deformation theories can be used for the thick beams also. So under this shear deformation theories, we have first order theories like Timoshenko beam theory and higher order theories like the Redis theory, Levinson's theories, like there are many higher order theories are there. So the drawback with the first order theories is that, for example, if you consider the case of Timoshenko beam theory, we, we have to use the shear correction factor. And in case of higher order theories, we know that we will have the multiple coupled Gauring differential equations and we have the uh, many unknown variables. So in this case, uh, that uh, uh, requires the, the necessity for a simple beam theory. And in this case, we will discuss uh, the third order uh, single variable simple beam theory. So in this work, we are doing the analysis of beams using a single variable beam theory. 
okay here we have the uh, single variable non local beam theory and uh, this is the displacement field of the the beam theory considered in this work that is uh, u is the that is the in plane or axial displacement and w is the that is the lateral displacement and if you refer to the rhs of equations 2 and 3 we have the only wb as as an unknown okay this is the uh, unknown variable in in the formulation of uh, this beam theory that is wb here also wb and if you refer to uh, the lateral deflection here also we have the wb as an unknown wb is the that is the bending component uh, Okay, next we have the expression for strain that by using the, the uh, relationship between the displacement, uh, strain and displacement, we can write expressions for strains that is the uh, epsilon x and uh, gamma zx. Uh, the, the, these are given by equations four and five. And next we have the equation six. So uh, the effect of uh, this Irinian's uh, theory uh, we can see here. For example, uh, in case of our uh, local uh, theories, we have sigma is equal to x modulus into epsilon. But in this case, we have the additional term. So from this step onwards, uh, we will have the, the uh, difference between the local elasticity and the no local elasticity. So in case of uh, when we uh, use the uh, Iringian's non-local theory, we will have these additional terms in the uh, relationship between the stress and strain. Okay. So in the equation six, we can see this difference. Okay, uh, next we have, uh, this is the, uh, in this case, we have considered a simply supported beam. Uh, here we can see the geometry, the length of the beam is L and uh, uh, width is uh, B and height of the beam is H. And uh, you can see the coordinate system also. This is defined in Cartesian coordinate system. And uh, similarly, next in equation seven, we have the bending moment that is from the stresses we have derived this, uh, uh, the bending moment expression. Here also you can see the effect of uh, Erangen's uh, uh, elasticity. Uh, okay, next we have the equations 8 and 9. Uh, these are the gross equilibrium equations. These equations we have seen in our uh, uh, conventional theories also. So these equilibrium equations are written in terms of bending moment, shear force and applied load. Here Q is the applied load and Mx is the bending moment and Qx is the shear force. Okay, these uh, equilibrium equations are used to derive the governing or differential equation of the equation. That is, we can see in the next uh, page, for example, equation 10. Uh, this is the uh, <coughs> governing differential equation for the case of uh, transverse vibration of a uh, beam. Okay, that is in this case, we have considered the micro or nano beam. Uh, for example, here you can see the uh, to represent the, the small scale effect, we have the this term here that is uh, coming from the Iringian's non-local elasticity theory. So this is the equation for vibration analysis. And uh, by uh, by reducing this equation 10 or by neglecting the, uh, the time uh, derivatives, we will have the equation for the bending that is for the starting uh, bending case. So uh, this is the equation 11. This is related to the static bending. Okay. In case of our uh, uh, Euler Bernoulli beam theory that is uh, based on local elasticity, we will have this term and the, this term. Uh, this term won't be there. So, in uh, this is the uh, governing differential equation corresponding to this theory, single variable, simple plate theory, uh, sim uh, beam theory. Okay. Uh, so, next we have the boundary conditions. Uh, since uh, we are solving the simply supported beam, so we have the simply supported boundary conditions. Uh, so uh, this uh, for bending analysis we are using two methods one is Navier's method uh, uh, that is the uh, we can assume the solution using the equation 14 uh, so this solution satisfies the boundary condition and one more method that is, that is the direct integra integration method that we have the, uh, the differential equation that we have to uh, integrate it four times so in case of bending analysis we have used two methods one is Navier's method and is direct uh, integration method so here we have the expression here uh, in this case we have the expression for lateral deflection using this we can calculate the bending deflection of the given beam uh, here also equation 16 also gives the bending deflection so next we have the uh, we have done the free vibration analysis that is for the case of simply supported beam uh, in this case we have used navier's method and uh, using uh, next we have the equation 18 U using equation 18 we can calculate the fundamental frequencies for the given beam so these are the uh, results that is the uh, this table one gives the results for the bending deflections so uh, we have calculated the, the deflections for uh, various h by l h is the uh, height of the beam and l is the length of the uh, length of the beam uh, 
the difference ratio is 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and uh, 0.1. Uh, uh, here we have the emotion group beam theory deflections. Here we have the Reddy beam theory deflections, and here we have this single variable theory. That is, this is using the Navier's method, and this is using the direct integration. And all other theories, uh, Timoshenko, Reddy, and uh, this theory results are matching. Uh, you can see uh, here also, here also, here also. For all uh, the results, are deflections are matching. Only uh, this euler bernoulli beam theory result deflections are deviating from the shear deformation theories. So here, whatever error that is with respect to the uh, euler bernoulli beam theory and the present uh, single variable theory. So the error is uh, in case as the thickness of the beam increases. Um, the error also increases. So uh, the euler bernoulli deflections are deviating from the uh, uh, shear deformation theory results. Similarly, we have the results for frequencies. Here also we have the euler bernoulli Timoshenko, and Reddy beam theory and uh, this present theory results. And uh, these errors are with respect to the euler bernoulli beam theory uh, frequencies. Uh, so the all uh, all other uh, Timoshenko, to reddy and uh, this theory results are matching only all your bernoulli uh, uh, frequencies are deviating okay so uh, we, uh, now we will come to the conclusion so uh, in conclusion what we can say is uh, this uh, the single variable non local beam theory can be used successful uh, for the case of uh, investigation of uh, the bending and frequency analysis of the beams and uh, this uh, theory single variable theory has the uh, many equations which are uh, similar to those of euler bernoulli beam theory so in the similar manner of euler bernoulli beam theory we can do the beam analysis using this theory also uh, that uh, how we can conclude and these are the references and uh, these are the uh, okay uh, that is uh, my presentation done sir okay thank you sir thank you rajesh sir uh -huh. for uh, informative presentation on the local beam theory However, uh, there are a few questions that I have. Okay, um, sir. Hmm. Uh, first of all, I would like the audience to please, if they have any questions, they can ask Shetty, sir. If not, then let me ask a few questions. Uh, you, sir, have talked about the uh, effect of bending. Uh, on yes. the lateral behavior on the uh, the lateral part of the bending on the uh, uh, na uh, natural frequency of the beams mm, yes so uh, you have taken into account the torsion of the uh, beams as well the the section what are the sectional properties and all how have you taken those into account the uh, modulus of elasticity is limited to the material only, but I have not seen any effects of the sectional properties in the equations. Can you please clarify? Uh, so sectional means you are talking about that uh, cross sectional. Uh, yeah, that uh, we have considered, sir. Which, uh, in the equation uh, uh, for the equation for natural frequencies, uh, there are all terms are there, right? Means area okay. then. Uh, a moment of inertia all those terms appear sir in the expression okay okay so the the uh, potential of the torsional uh, 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 capacity of the section or the torsional uh, deformation capacity of the section has also been taken into account no only bending and shear yes uh, yes sir yeah bending and shear sir. Yeah. okay so the three type of forces have been considered however Okay, thank you very much, sir. That is all from my side. Okay, sir. If anybody else has any question, they can please ask. Okay. Rajesh, sir, I have a very small question. Uh, okay. In your title, it reflects like, as you uh, wrote here, micro nano beams. Uh, yes, sir. Can you please explain the meaning? Because whenever Dr. Arnav is uh, discussing, you said you are taking some dimensions, but at one point you are writing micro nano beams. Mm, yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, whatever in the Iringian's model, uh, that Iringian's non local elasticity theory that is meant for the analysis of micro and nano beams. 
the whatever additional term uh, appearing the expression for uh, uh, in the expression for uh, that uh, stress and strain uh, that uh, captures the small small scale effects okay these whatever additional terms are appearing that is related to the small scale effects uh, so uh, for example if you use the look uh, the beam theory is based on local elasticity and uh, when we use the uh, iringens model we can uh, see the differences in the deflections and frequencies uh, we obtain after the analysis uh, for example uh, uh, for example if you use the euler bernoulli beam theory based on uh, local elasticity and if you use the euler bernoulli beam theory based on uh, iringens model we can see the difference in the the deflections and frequencies uh, we obtain okay so whatever additional terms uh, appear in the formulation using the iringens model that corresponding to the uh, means uh, these uh, these non local theories can capture the small scale effects uh, so that is the uh, meaning of means micro and uh, nano beams means we can this can be used for uh, uh, micro beams also okay, okay sir thank you thank you thank you very much thank you sir i would now request dr kisa to please uh, present her work uh, the title of the work is uh, behavior of aerated alkali activated composite wall panels uh, good morning sir i'll just share my screen sir sure ma'am sure sir is my screen uh, visible Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, I have some network issues. So if I switch on my video, I think my audio will have some problem because I'm uh, presenting. No, no problem, there, okay, no problem you. there, ma'am. No problem there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all the members present here. So my work is on behavior of aerated alkali activated composite wall panels, and my paper ID is two fifty six. The authors of this paper are myself, uh, Dr. M. Selvakumar, and Mrs. S. Muthulakshmi, who presented a little earlier. Uh, we are uh, working um, as uh, faculty in the department of civil engineering rajalakshmi engineering college chennai uh, so uh, i have just tried a new material I, i i wouldn't say a new material because now we have been talking about geopolymer concrete saying that it is a sustainable construction material so the main thing that we need to go for an alternate construction material is con considering the environmental uh, uh, effects now so there are two main reasons why we are now uh, getting into alternate uh, construction materials one is the high amount of carbon dioxide that is released du during the production of portland cement so i've just given a simple calculation here so approximately when we are manufacturing 1 ton of cement the amount of carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere is around 1 ton of car um, carbon dioxide here and next thing is since india is a country where we depend on coal as a major power source and 70% of our uh, power is ma mainly from uh, uh, coal based uh, power generation the uh, uh, disposal of fly ash becomes a big problem here so the uh, main thing that they are doing is mostly the fly ash is being disposed of in the nearby lands uh, which also causes environmental hazards and apart from it the dumping of lands also uh, has a lot of uh, issues like uh, taking away the Uh, valuable lands which could be used for uh, agriculture and other purposes so these are the two main aspects why we are looking into new building construction materials and uh, next thing is i have just given a statistics of about uh, the quantity of fly ash generated and the amount of fly ash that has been utilized in construction industry so uh, in india there is a, a large scope of work and actually there have been a large scope of uh, work that has been carried out in fly ash we have gone for high volume fly ash in um, mass construction uh, like uh, pavement roller compacted concrete and all those things and we have also seen that fly ash uh, incorporation in concrete and also uh, as a replacement in uh, as cement in uh, concrete has given numerous uh, advantages like in improving the durability uh, of concrete and also uh, we we have uh, taken over the scarcity of uh, Uh, mining of sands because around 30 to 35 percentage of fly ash re replacement is allowable in concrete, which actually results uh, in large savings of uh, the natural aggregate that have been used in concrete. So the next thing is uh, the alternate to avoid using the cement as a binding material is something called as geopolymer concrete. 
where again there is a potential use of using high volume fly ash. Uh, here, uh, uh, the main uh, uh, difference between a conventional concrete and geopolymer concrete is there we have a, a hydration reaction where calcium silicate hydrate is formed, but here we have a polymeric reaction. And for this polymeric reaction, which actually contributes to the strength of the geopolymer concrete, we need some alkali activation to be done to this uh, fly ash uh, uh, material. So for alkali activation, generally a lot of combinations of uh, chemicals have been gone into uh, practice. Uh, a combination of uh, hydroxide with silicate is the best combination here. So for my work, I have taken sodium hydroxide and sodium silicate. And again, we have some chemical calculations to be taken into considerations for getting the strength that we actually require. So the main constituent that contributes to the strength of a geopolymer concrete is the uh, alumina silica bonds along with oxygen bonds. So we can classify it into many types depending upon the structure of the bonds that are formed. I've just given a, 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 a some type of the bonds that are uh, determined to form in this geopolymer concrete. And in this work, I've not only taken this geopolymer concrete, I've combined another uh, type of uh, special concrete here in order to make it a lightweight because nowadays we go for something uh, uh, some constructions which has to be done in a very faster pace we go we talk about uh, fast track constructions and also we talk about precast constructions but uh, we are not uh, uh, that uh, effective in using it one mainly because we still depend upon conventional concrete uh, which has a density of around 2400 to 2500 kg per meter cube and handling that concrete as precast structural members creates a, a large problem both in erecting and also in transporting. So my attempt was to reduce the density of the concrete without compromising the uh, strength of the concrete. So I have uh, incorporated geopolymer concept in aerated concrete which is a special type of lightweight concrete. So here uh, Co-segregate is actually eliminated in this type of concrete. So we will be having a binding at ma material and a fine aggregate alone here. And the normal water cement ratio 0.3 to 0.5 can be used here. And superplasticizer will be used for improving the workability. And this is actually the fresh concrete. Uh, uh, you can see that there is a um, bulging of the concrete in its fresh. This is due to aeration. Aluminium powder is the aerating agent I'm using here. Not only aluminium powder, hydrogen peroxide can also be used. But aluminium powder, since I've worked more on this, uh, it feels convenient for me in using this aluminium powder. Now it is commercially available. We get this aluminium powder, commercial-based aluminium powder in three grades. Uh, and the concept, the, chem the concept behind this aeration is I've just given the equation what actually happens here. The aluminium powder that is incorporated in the mix reacts with the calcium hydroxide that is present in the fly ash and the GGBS, uh, releasing hydrogen gas, which actually forms isolated air voids. But the air voids formed here is not actually continuous. So we have done some image analysis and also some in order to uh, prove that there are, there are no connected air voids here, which will affect the durability of the structure. So this uh, liberation of hydrogen gas actually forms a porous matrix, which is responsible for the lightweight of the material. So here in this work, I have combined uh, geopolymer concrete with the aerated concrete in making a composite. So why I call it as a composite is I have also introduced some steel fibers in order to improve the flexural resistance of the member. So my work actually has uh, two uh, phases. So one phase was characterization of the material. And the second phase was I've just made a small wall panel and tested it for a basic test of load versus deflection. So I'll just explain the materials and the methodology as we go by. So I've taken class F fly ash that I get from my um, the local power plant here and the aluminum powder that I've used as a commercially available con 95 grade. I've given the details in the paper and also the chemical composition of the material is given in the forthcoming slides here. And as I've told, the alkaline activators I've used is sodium hydroxide pellets and sodium silicate. So it's a laboratory grade chemicals that have been used. And uh, I've just fixed, uh, 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 I've not gone into a lot of work in com in finding out the molarity of the sodium hydroxide and the alkaline activator solution because I have done a lot of work on it and published many papers. So I have just taken the optimum combination as 10 molar sodium hydroxide. And the sodium silicate by sodium hydroxide ratio, I fixed it as one point because I have many other parameters to vary in this particular study. And second thing is, I'm not going for, generally there is a, 
a concept that geopolymer concrete can attain strength only if it is oven cured but now we have come across lot of ambient cured yar cured geopolymer also so in this study i have also taken a ambient uh, cured geopolymer aerated concrete here so for this ggbs actually helps a lot so i attempted a 50% replacement of fly ash with ggbs i've done it in a, in a sequence and uh, i've used a very uh, variation in the dosage of aluminium powder because uh, people who need to get a particular strength can choose the aluminium uh, powder dosage based on the experimental results and the steel fibers i've used is a commercially available dramic steel fiber and the aspect ratio of the fiber is 60 and i've used it as 1 to 5 percentage i've varied so since there are lot of parameters that i'm using uh, in this study i have gone for a response surface methodology of central composite design in order to limit my experimental uh, trials and also in order to arrive at some meaningful conclu conclusions uh, so this is the uh, physical and chemical properties of fly ash and ggbs and uh, for the experimental factors i have taken a minimum of 10 and maximum of 50 and uh, uh, i have used a hobart mixer for the material characterization and as per is code i have used the specific uh, samples for testing the compressive strength flexural strength and also the split tensile strength i have also done anova analysis in order to ascertain that my experimental results have been uh, correct so these are some the experimental discussions as i told you the density of the concrete that i have done is uh, less than uh, uh, 2400 it ranges from around 1022 to 1200 kg per meter cube you can see here even uh, one thing is only by the incorporation of highest steel fibers i am able to get 1200 otherwise my uh, density ranges uh, is within 1140 and so and i am able to achieve a compressive strength of around 28 mpa you can see from the response surface graphs that i have given here and my flexural strength is around the 2.5 to 3.1 and my split tensile strength is around 2.6 to 2.8 the maximum i'm talking about here so after uh, getting a characterization i need to optimize the values in order to get a final mix proportion so that my wall panels can be casted with the final proportion so here i've got the um, uh, optimized mix proportion i have also done uh, uh, experimental uh, uh, trials using this optimum mix proportion and i have seen that the uh, results that i have observed Uh, is equal to the predicted one that has been given by the software based on my experimental values and this is the wall panel that i have casted based on this aerated geopolymer composite and i have just done a simple test using a reaction frame of 30 ton capacity i have just taken the deflection and i have uh, found uh, got a maximum deflection of 5 mm for these wall panels the size of the wall panel is uh, 0.5 meter width and 1 meter in length 3 feet and uh, the conclusions are uh with a uh, volatility of 10 molar and uh, alkaline activation ratio of 1.5 i was able to achieve a strength that would be uh, sufficient uh, uh, for a, um, a wall panel to be used even in load bearing member and the thickness of the wall panel was very less so i don't have to go for a uh, one brick wall thickness uh, i can just uh, get it in 15 cm for uh, uh, wall panel and uh, this will also result in the a reduction in dead load of the material which will also result in economical foundation design and also the other uh, structural elements uh, the size of the other structural elements can also be reduced with respect to the dead load when the uh, i mean self weight of the material actually reduces so this is a beginning part as i made this in a wall panel so the next work will be extension of this into uh, columns and beams structural works of columns and beams uh, with the minimum reinforcement along with the fiber reinforced aerated geopolymer concrete uh, one thing is uh, uh, i would not say it is uh, uh, very cheap as uh, compared to the concrete because the cost of 1 kg of concrete today even in spite of uh, the hype in the hike in the building materials is uh, around 5 to 6 kg per meter cube of course here the cost for this uh, uh, chemicals is a bit a bit cost but now there are lot of research wherein uh, it has been given as a one stop solution of uh, manufacture of this alkaline uh, chemicals and i think there is a factory uh, that has come in uh, down south where they have uh, started giving this in a very uh, low price so as we start using it the commercialization and the production of this chemical will also be uh, uh, in an economical mode in order to utilize this fly ash wholly as a construction material eliminating the use of cement uh, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present in this uh, conference thank you sir
Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for an informative presentation. In fact, I, I was uh, so uh, looking forward to the work that uh, you promised that you will conduct in the future. Yeah, sure, I sir. I'm, so, I'm doing it. Uh, it is in progress. Sir. I, I just wish to see what the effect of uh, uh, how the structural members of these, this geopolymer concrete will behave. Yes, sir. So that will be interesting to see. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Anyone in the meeting can ask anything. Okay. Uh, even I Good afternoon. Have any question. Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hey, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. I have uh, two, three small questions. Yeah, sure, sir. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I think it is not in your uh, objective or scope of work, but uh, whenever we are looking into the new material, like uh, as you said, it is a composite and you have added so many things like mm -hmm. geopolymer concrete, you have done aeration and you added GGBS and fibers also. Yes, sir. Whenever we are looking into the new material, uh, we are looking into the durability also. Yeah, sir, I have done it, but due to the limitations in the number of pages, I actually wanted to add, add this wall panel testing here, sir. I have done it, sir. I have done some softivity and uh, rapid chloride penetration test also. Uh, and uh, I have uh, found it to be uh, same as the conventional concrete, sir, though it was an aerated concrete. So uh, also I have substantiated my softivity test and rapid chloride penetration test with microstructure analysis also with SEM images and optical microscope images, where I've also measured the porosity of the material, where I could get a variation uh, uh, and the volume of the distribution of the pores. I've done it, sir, but I've not uh, presented in this yeah. due to uh, the page restrictions. Actually, I'm curious about the uh, durability issues also and okay, porosity also, because yes. it is an aerated yeah. concrete. So yes. that is that is why. Hmm. I would like to send it, sir, if uh, needed. Maybe I no, no, add no, no issue. No okay, okay ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Pankaj, anything else? Uh, no, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, okay. you, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I would request Ms. Kohima Desai to please present her work. Yes, sir. So is my PPT visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. PPT is visible. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kohima Desai, PG student of Goa Engineering College. Uh, the authors of this paper are uh, me and uh, my guide, Dr. Sumitra Kandulkar, uh, Associate Professor of Goa Engineering College. Uh, the name of my paper is Coastal Slope Failure Analysis, a case study on Baga Hill, Goa. Uh, so India is a peninsular country uh, with about around 7,500 kilometers of long coastline out of which about 1,600 of coastline is affected by coastal slope erosion. The Goa also being a small state also contributes to this uh, slope erosion. So there is a need uh, to analyze these slopes and to find the me failure mechanisms to evaluate the failure mechanisms and to identify the areas which are under the risk. So the aim of our study was to mainly numerically analyze the st stability of the slope using the liquid equilibrium method based software, namely the GeoStudio 2018 uh, to identify the parameters which led to the slope failure along with the retaining wall, which was built to support the slope and to suggest some remedial measures to stabilize the slope. Uh, we have considered the Baga Hill as our site uh, for the study. Uh, so in our study, uh, we considered a coastal slope popularly known as the Baga Hill. This hill is surrounded uh, by Baga Ma Beach. Ma'am, hello. Ma'am, your PPT, yes. the slides are not changing. If even if you are changing them, please look into it why that is happening. The slides are not changing from the title slide only. OK, so you have moved, so now, moved ahead. Thank you. Yes, they are. They are. Thank you. Please continue.
Uh, so the, the, the this hill is surrounded by the Baga beach on the three sides. Uh, there is also the approach road which goes to the, uh, which goes to the top of the hill. Uh, so uh, in 2013, there was a slope failure uh, which had occurred at this hill, after which the concerned authorities had constructed a concrete retaining wall of the height three meters to stabilize the slope. But again in 2000. 20 uh, in month of august there were three consecutive landslides uh, which led to this slope failure and also the retaining wall which was built to support the slope also collapsed uh, so this is the uh, the figure two shows the landslide zone in this uh, the first picture shows the retaining wall which is still intact but uh, tilted And the figure two shows the collapsed part of the retaining wall. This retaining wall was of height three meters. I'm not seeing it again. PPT. I'm sorry for, you, for disturbing you again and again. Uh, so, so I can present from this slide only. Like now, please, it is visible. Please. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so the figure two shows the tilted part. The figure two shows the uh, landslide zone of the retaining wall. The figure one shows the retaining wall, which is intact but tilted. And the figure two shows the collapsed part of the retaining wall. Uh, this is the slope profile of the retaining wall, uh, of the Baga slope. Uh, here we have divided the slope into two parts. That is the slope A and the slope B. And this is the approach road of width 2.5 which leads to the top of the hill so slope a is where the landslide had taken place in 2013 and also in 2020 in the year 2020 uh, the trees along the slope uh, were uprooted which increased the erosion the slope b is still uh, intact and undamaged and stable but trees along the slope were inclined which indicates there is a slow deformation of the slope uh, this is the retaining wall which was collapsed after the slope failure in this part. Uh, after the thorough study of the uh, site, the soil characterization was done on the soil sample from the site. The various uh, laboratory tests was carried out. Uh, the internal friction angle and the cohesion were found to be 10 degrees and 30 kPa respectively from the direct shear test. Uh, also, the wet sieve analysis was carried out. Uh, from which uh, it was found that the soil contained more than 50% of the fines. Hence, the sedimentation analysis was carried out. After the sedimentation analysis, it was found that the soil had about 63% of the silt and 2% of the clay content. Also, the so soil had 13% of the sand. Uh, the next test which was carried out was the constant head permeability test to find the permeability of the soil. It was found that uh, uh, the soil had 4.33 into 10 raised to minus 4 centimeters per second of the permeability, which indicated that uh, it had the poor drainage capacity. Uh, from all the laboratory tests uh, results, it was uh, the soil was classified as the silty soil with the intermediate plasticity. The these are the uh, soil properties uh, which were. Uh, found using the various laboratory tests. Next, the stability analysis of the slope was done using the Geo Studio 2018 Slope W software. The analysis was done using Morgenstern price method as this method satisfies both force and the moment equilibrium. Uh, the slope was assumed to have uh, the homogeneous soil properties. These were the input parameters which was used, which were used in the software. Uh, the height of the slope was taken as 42 meters and it was calculated from the Google Earth. Uh, after the input parameters, the slope was modeled and analyzed using the software. The analysis was done in the three parts. Firstly, the entire Baga hill was considered for the analysis. That is, the slope A and B was considered. Uh, secondly, the analysis of the only the failed portion of the slope was done. 
that was uh, that is with the retaining wall and the without retaining wall and thirdly the analysis of the failed portion of the slope was done by uh, with the by taking into account the different slope angles that is the 13 degree 19 degree and 20 degree uh, after the uh, um, after modeling and the analysis the output parameters the two output parameters were obtained that is the factor of safety and the critical uh, slip surface Uh, if the factor of safety was less than one, uh, the slope was said to be unstable. Uh, the slip surfaces which were obtained uh, can be either be shallow or the deep, depending on which the stabilization methods can be suggested. Uh, so this was the first result what we got after the analysis. The first we had done the uh, analysis of the entire Baga Hill. the this figure shows the analysis the total height and the length of this uh, slope was considered as 42 meters and length was considered as 112 meters the ground water level as this is the coastal slope uh, the ground water level was taken as 4 meters uh, the green color indicates the uh, failure zone the slope would fail like uh, from this part this is the critical failure surface and the red zone uh, indicates the critical failure zone which might collapse in the near future the factor of safety obtained was 0.807 which was less than 1.5 hence the slope was uh, unstable this is the uh, analysis of the failed portion of the baga hill uh, the uh, height of the slope was taken as 20 meters and the length was 57 meters this was done without any rem remedial measures and the factor of safety obtained was 1.33 seven uh next the uh, analysis was done using only uh, using the retaining wall that is the remedial measures measure was taken while uh, analyzing the slope the factor of safety was 1.569 which was greater than uh, 1.5 but after the slope failure uh, which occurred in 2020 this retaining wall also failed uh so and then uh, the analysis was done uh, with taking into account the different slope angles uh, that is the 13 degrees 19 degrees and 25 degrees uh, as we increased the slope angles the factor of safety decreased hence we can infer that the steeper the slopes the more vulnerable will be the failure after the proper study of the analysis the following interpretations were made Uh, which may have led to the failure of the slope and the retaining wall firstly was the drainage system the slope was not provided with the proper drainage facility only the whip holes were provided to the retaining wall uh, which blocked the res uh, which got blocked from the residual mat matter uh, and uh, the pressure was exerted on the retaining wall this could be the re reason for the failure of the retaining wall secondly the preliminary design of the retaining wall Uh, the preliminary uh, the retaining wall was not able to take the lateral pressure from the slope thirdly the soil type as uh, we have seen earlier that the soil was the silty uh, which had the poor drainage uh, capacity so uh, the soil was not able to drain the uh, water during the uh, rainy season uh, which increased the uh, load on the retaining wall third was the geometry the slope under the study was 42 meters high and had the steep angle and the, uh, we have seen that the steeper slopes are more likely to undergo the uh, failure than the flatter slopes third was the presence of the surface runoff and the geometry so during the rainy season the surface runoff seeps into the soil and as a study area consists of the soil with the poor drainage conditions the more water pressure is exerted So after the study, some pre preventive measures were suggested. First was the uh, to provide the vertical drainage behind the retaining wall. Uh, so this permits the water to flow under drain system, uh, and uh, the 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 uh, by providing the vertical drainage, we can improve the drainage capacity of the uh, slope. And second was to provide the turf reinforcement mat. In this, the vegetation is uh, the. Uh, the uh, vegetation is grown 
and uh, due to the due to this uh, plants uh, the, the, there is a permanent anchoring of the vegetation mat to the soil surface and hence uh, it reduces the uh, erosion capacity of the soil. Uh, this type that is the, the turf reinforcement mat is uh, suitable for the heavy runoff areas. So uh, the, we can conclude from this study uh, that the slope was uh, the slope was analyzed using the limit equilibrium based method the geo studio the analysis shows that the entire Baka hill was vulnerable to the landslide also the stability analysis of the field slope shows uh, that it was unstable and also after the construction of the retaining wall the factor of safety was increased but there was but the slope was still unstable also the various Conditions were inferred from the study, that is the poor drainage facility, the rainfall, geometry of the slope, the soil condition of the slope, and the groundwater. Uh, so after the after interpretations of the various uh, reasons for the slope failure, uh, the some remedial measures like the providing the drainage, proper drainage to the slope and to control the erosion. Uh, some of the preventive measures were suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Koima, for a wonderful presentation. This has been a case study, uh, which is pretty effective, I think. So I congratulate you for the work, and I would like to ask the audience to please, if they have any questions, to please ask. Okay. In that case, Kohima, I would like to suggest if you want to continue this work uh, any further, there are various type of uh, land uh, stabilizing agents as well as new technologies which are used for uh, stability of slopes. So you can definitely explore those as well, like soil yeah. healing and all. So uh, please, uh, good work done. I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, sir. I I would now look, like to call Dr. Pandey for his presentation on design and construction of a rainwater harvesting system, a new approach. Dr. Pandey. Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, you are. Sir, is my screen is visible, sir? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Okay. 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 Just give me one minute, sir. Sure. Maybe my screen is visible. Yes, yes, it is visible now. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, sir, so first I would like to thank uh, Honorable Chair to giving me this opportunity to present this my topic or work done which I have done for this uh, conference. So uh, my topic is design and construction of rainwater harvesting system, a new approach. So I am presenting this. So the content which I have selected shortly are in a small way. Those are the introduction, then literature review, objective, then methodology, and then material and methods, then cost analysis or cost estimation, then result and discussion, conclusion and references. 
so basically as we know that uh, uh, lots of work uh, have already been done in the field Sir, of your, work. hello uh, pandit ji i am very sorry to say that ye yeah, this uh, presentation slides are not changing sir but i am changing this why it is not changing i don't understand sir uh, are you changing it in full screen mode yes sir yeah i did it so, but the the part that you shared is not a full screen you have just shared the powerpoint window you have not okay, shared sir. the presentation okay 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 just so what i would recommend is you to press alt and tab on your keyboard together you go to the full you go to the present button and select the full screen view yes sir i am here i have selected f5 so maybe it is not visible no you can on your ppt you can press f5 the full screen mode will start then yeah. you should without pressing escape you should press alt and tab to go to google meet can you do that uh, no sir just i am sharing the presentation it asks share yes i did it so it is showing um, stop sharing option means it is visible it should be visible it is it is now the second slide is visible i hope it does remain so please continue so i may i go for full screen sir f5 now uh it won't help that if you will press f5 it will change what i am asking you once you press f5 on your ppt yeah. you have to press alt tab go to google meet again okay okay then after pressing f5 okay and then yes, i did and then f5 you share your screen and if, now when you will select you will get you will you will be seeing two ppts there a full screen version and a powerpoint window you have to share the full screen version yes sir yes sir only it is full screen i can see this maybe full screen ver version is only visible to you sir i think it is not visible to us we can just see the powerpoint version okay okay so now uh, the slide is changing or not sir it is not rakesh sir yes, in sir. google meet there is three dot at bottom side na more options yes. go there and from full screen start third row there is a full screen option go there and okay. Sir, three dots are visible in my name only, so I should press here. You can continue like this also. There is no problem with that. You just continue with this mode of presentation as well. Don't go for full screen. Okay, sir. Okay. So we can see there is there is a lot of scarcity of water. nowadays and during the summer we are facing a huge problem of water crisis and especially in some cities of india like sometimes in delhi we have seen sometimes in hyderabad we are also see and some uh, districts of up uh, and some districts of mp we are facing huge scarcity of water during the summers so how we can minimize this uh, scarcity of water or how we can reduce this this is one of one one more attempt we can make that is rain water harvesting so this may be 
considered as a solution uh, for uh, rainwater har harvesting uh, we can make it uh, full utilize and even it can be utilized for a smaller scale or at maybe a larger scale so for this point uh, the conservation of the water is one of the most talked issue in this uh, century and most of the indian households and commercial buildings does not foster these precious rain water which get wasted and they go slightly to the drains so that is why this paper will attempt to study and made investigation uh, for the rain water to harvest it and we can get the good quality and quantity of water which are required so for this uh, little bit of literature review which is has been done by me or i have taken so uh, i have collected the data from deepak kare uh, at all that is uh, uh, who have done work in 2004 related to the impact of rain water harvesting in ground water quality at indore and devas and uh, they have collected the data uh, from the existing tube wells and they collected the rain rooftop rain water was passed through the sand filters which will reduce the concentration of pollutants in the ground water means uh, they have used some sand filters and the water which is collected through the rooftop uh, they may reduce the concentration of the pollutants which is present in the water and then one more study uh, which is uh, conducted by sharma and jain so they did their experiment in nagpur city where they have selected a, a rooftop area around 100 square meter and the water collected that was around 80000 liters and that was recharged so what was the observation of them that uh, during the whole season what they have found initially uh, they checked the water level and after the rain water harvesting they found there is 1 meter change in the uh, water level so after that uh, it was uh, the objective of my study was that to design and construct a rain water harvesting system in such a way that that the design should be appropriate cost should be minimum and uh, we can utilize that rain water harvesting system as per flexibility or as per our requirement and the output of this water um, our rain water should be uh, we can uh, consume or we can take full water with quantity and quality so for this the methodology which is adopted for this uh, study and uh, practical approach that was the physical design consideration means how we had uh, designed this system then we have also checked or tested the quality of water especially we checked the order or some visual test then turbidity and ph level also test checked and then uh, the system quality check means we have checked there should not be no leakage or uh, some other deficiency should also checked and then we have also taken the material which are having the isi quality or standard and then after that last we have estimated the cost of this installation or total design of this project so for this we have selected basically the pvc pipe for uh, appropriate diameter as per our requirement so in present study what uh, we have did uh, 100 square meter catchment area or area is selected for this and it was estimated that the rainfall of this city is around 1000 mm so length of pipe pvc pipe was selected 1 meter along with the accessories which are tabulated in the next table so we have taken uh, 
I have taken the top view and we can say elevation of this uh, uh, PVC pipe. So we have uh, used two reducers and in between uh, we have uh, placed some uh, force aggregate, fine aggregates for the filtration of this rainwater and uh, then we have uh, designed this. So the whole system how it will function. So first uh, this uh, system is fitted in such a way like uh, the water which will collected through the PVC pipe. Uh, from the rooftop will collect it and will come through a pipe PVC pipe and then it will pass through this rain water harvesting system uh, which is having around one meter in length and we have arranged the course aggregate in such a way that uh, in bottom or in this side we can say the lower or lower side lower stream we have used the uh, coarse aggregate like 12 uh, to 20 mm in size then above this one feet approximately so each of this uh, pipeline is divided into three sections so in bottom zone we are using one feet approximately so that is uh, the size of aggregate are 12 mm to 20 mm then above this we are using 6 to 12 mm pebbles and then in top we are using 2 to 6 mm Able. So this uh, the water collected through this pipe and it enter through this uh, point D and it will move from D to uh, this and uh, P point. So it will pass through the finer particles then coarser particle then uh, gravel particles. So in sequence this water will flow and, uh, and this system is designed on the intensity of the rainfall. So this water may be accommodated through this pipe and it will uh, means it should not be overflow so we have to design the uh, we have to take the diameter in such a way that it will accommodate the intensity of the rainfall which will be there in a particular time so the size of the pipe uh, should be selected properly so what we have selected as per our requirement we have taken the pipe PVC pipe that was one meter and uh, the costing of this pipe uh, around 150 rupees per meter. Similarly, we used uh, reducers. So they may cost 150 rupees per pieces in this way. Then we have used floor drains, then epoxy raisins we use. We use some coals in the top of this fine aggregates. Then we have used some alum also to check the turbidity of the water. And then we have used coarse aggregate, fine aggregate and some hot glue. We have also used to uh, seal this uh, accessories which are used with this. So the cost of the material which we have used will come around 930 rupees approximately. And with if we will add some plumbing charges uh, for our installation of this, so we can come to uh, that the cost will be around 1500 rupees. So we have fitted this uh, rainwater harvesting system in the existing drainage line of this uh, building, our home. So after uh, this uh, designing and if we have compared with some conventional design system, so generally our uh, casting is around 10 times, 10 times lesser than the uh, presently which we are using for design of uh, rainwater harvesting system. So that cost may come around 10 to 15,000. And because the cost is reduced due to which, uh, because uh, we have used the existing system, our uh, drainage, our uh, water collection system through the uh, rooftop. So we have fitted our harvesting system in that pipeline that is why our cost is reduced so it will be ultimately will uh, benefited to the liz people or the people who cannot invest more money so this system is very economical and ultimately we can say it will solve the problem where we are not recharging our uh, uh, tube wells or wells or uh, sometimes we need our uh, uh, 
we want to recharge our natural resources so definitely it is going to be uh, help us and ultimately uh, the objective of this paper which was that it should produce the good quality of uh, water and which can be used uh, for the purpose of uh, maybe uh, to store the water uh, which may be utilized further uh, applications maybe uh, gardening purpose or maybe uh, washing of cloths uh, or cleaning of utensils etc so this can be also done and sometimes it will be very helpful for some other purposes also so in this way i can conclude that this design may be very effective uh, to harvest this precious resource that is rain water and it will if it may be adopted in large scale so definitely uh, the scarcity of the water may be reduced so in this uh, paper i have uh, shown very uh, less content but uh, i think this may be helpful to everyone and these are the references through which i have collected the data so thank you very much thank you pandit ji thank you very much for the wonderful presentation it was innovative in its own way and i hope it find its users in the normal households soon enough thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you very much At last, very basic yes. question. You have yes. conducted any study on uh, what of which you are you are getting after this harvesting rain water harvesting system? As you said, it is useful in cleaning utensils, washing clothes, and other purposes. Please come again, sir. As you said, uh, this water can be used for cleaning utensils, washing clothes, and all. Na? Mm -hmm. So, I am looking into that. Uh, you have gone through any kind of taste on yes, water? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. I have gone through the uh, pH level test, then turbidity test. Because results are not available in presentation. That yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have not mentioned, but the pH level. Uh, by using this alum or the pebbles or uh, different types of sand layers we have used so ph level reduced around 10 to 15 ppm sir okay thank you thank you sir Thank you very much, Pandeji. Uh, we have one more presentation here, but I do not know. I cannot see Ms. Akila Lal in the list of the attendees. Uh, I have contacted her through WhatsApp. Uh, we'll wait for two minutes before. Uh, I hope she responds. She joins the meeting and presents her work. In the meantime, let us have an overview of the uh, various presentations that we had in our session today. So in all, we had eight presentations. One, uh, uh, the variation in the uh, uh, themes or the areas of these presentation was very high, but the overall content uh, of the presentations was very good. Uh, Ms. Muthu Lakshmi and Dr. Geeta have presented very, very innovative works uh, regarding the uh, first, in first case, they have presented the uh, use of crushed seashells, seashell waste. And uh, Dr. Geeta has put forth a very interesting concept of uh, uh, composite uh, concrete, uh, geopolymer composite concrete, which was even uh, which even had reinforcement. So, I appreciate the work that they have done. Miss Desai has presented a very uh, 
wonderful presentation on uh, the design of uh, on the slope stability slope stability she she presented some very basic and innovative measures to reduce uh, the landslide potential of slopes uh, dr shetty has presented a very good overview of local beam theories and has uh, introduced us to the concept of micro and nano beams and how to analyze them uh, Dr. Pandey definitely has given a new thought towards rainwater harvesting, which is a economical as well as, as a very innovative thought. And last but not the least in the list is Mr. Anurag Sharma, who very briefly but uh, very uh, crisply pointed out the advantages and disadvantages of direct displacement based design methods. So I have just been informed that there is some problem with Ms. Akhila's uh, device. So with this and with the permission of Dr. Pankaj, I would ask him if he wills that we can declare this session closed. And Dr. Pankaj, over to Dr. Pankaj. Yes, we can. Thank you, Dr. Arno and all the presenter. We we both wish you very all the very best for your future works. We look forward to your works. We will be following you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You can all leave the meeting. We will meet in the keynote sessions. Thank you very much.